on. There we go. Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning to Stony Point. We are so happy you've joined us uh, for this very warm Labor Day weekend. Uh, it is good to be together and worship with one another. There are a few things um, as we kind of move towards the fall uh, that we are going to be able to return to here at Stony Point. And we're very excited about them and hope you and your family will be able to join us for those. Um, and the first one is next Monday evening on uh, September 14th, our men's Bible study will begin to meet again. They'll be back here on the back patio. It'll be a video study, and it's uh, by Max Lucado called the Anxious for Nothing. And uh, what a timely uh, time to study that. Um, and we'd love to have you uh, men join us. If you're interested, you can... Uh, speak with Jim Wright and sign up for that, and then uh, you can get the book on Amazon or on christianbook.com. And then next Sunday, um, we're very excited that we're going to be able to open up our children's ministry once more. We'll be having a children's service over on our back lawn, and if you have children, uh, we would encourage you to take advantage of that. Look this week for an email about some of the details that will cover all the check-in process and uh, how to go about being prepared for that. And next Sunday morning, then you'll check on, in on the back of our children's building uh, for that. And then in addition to that, um, we are very excited to be returning to some things that are normal family life here at Stony Point. Um, I think the thing we've probably missed the most is just the regular interactions and the celebrations um, and being able to cry and laugh and celebrate with one another. And so on October 4th, Sunday, October 4th, we are going to be able to return to some of those things. And we are going to have our baby, our first baby dedication since all of this happened. And uh, we would love, if you have a baby or a child that needs to be dedicated, uh, we would love to do that on Sunday morning. We believe strongly in parents dedicating themselves to the task of raising children to know the things of God and presenting the gospel to them. So you can sign up two ways. You can either contact our church office or Pastor Roz uh, to sign up for that, and we'd love to have you do that. And then one last one, youth group will be returning this coming Wednesday here on the property at 630. And if you have teenagers, junior high or high school students, they would love for you to join them for that service. If you want to stand, we're going to get ready for a time of worship this morning. It is good to be here on this very warm day. there. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see your faces this morning. It is warm this morning, but we are going to just worship the Lord and um, thank him this morning for wonderful things. Um, wonderful things um, are going on and happening still, and we're so thankful for them, and I have so much to be thankful for the Lord this week. I want to start with just a word of scripture, Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down, and you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Amen. I find that so comforting this morning and that he... Um, is behind us and before us, that he, his hand is laid upon us. Amen. So let's just worship him this morning. In heaven thundered and the world was born In the dust you form, faith commanded, and the mountains moved. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. And freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus has overcome. And mercy triumphed when the third day dawned. Darkness was denied when the storm was gone. Amen. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. 
Good morning to you. Let's see, I see the gardeners there. Good morning, gardeners. Good morning, Septimos. Good morning to all of you and your cars back there. We're so glad that you're here. Good morning, Smiths. Psalm 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. I pray this morning that you are reminded that God loves you, amen, and that he created us for a purpose and a reason this morning, and I pray that you would just feel his love this morning through worshiping him and hearing the truths of his word this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, it's free. people struggling with disease in their bodies and sickness in their bodies this morning but we need to lift those up that maybe we know that are amen there are a lot of needs and we can lift those up and and God can set us free of a lot of things within ourselves amen amen who am I that the highest king would welcome me 
I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me whom the Son sets free oh it's free In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. You are chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Worship him this morning. I pray that you are reminded of that this morning.
your faithfulness, oh, I will rest. In the promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. And oh, I will rest in your promises. testify this morning that God has brought us out of darkness, that God has been faithful through each struggle that we've ever endured in, in our life so far, that God is faithful. We need to remember that this morning, that our confidence and our hope is in him this morning, in him alone, that the things of this world, are, we cannot rely on them. Amen? But we can rely on the Lord and the truths of his word and his love for us and the assurance that we were created for a purpose in him. Amen. Amen. So wonderful to worship you with this morning. If you are, it's your first time here, we thank you for being here and we welcome you. We're glad to see you. And um, amen. Let's see if I can get untangled from that microphone and the mask. <laughs> we want to welcome you once more. Uh, as Rosie said, it is truly a privilege to be here and to worship with one another and to celebrate God's goodness. Um, as we were talking this week at staff, uh, I was made aware, and it does not seem like it's possible, but six months ago today, six months of Sundays ago today, we voluntarily stepped back from having worship here, um, believing it was in the best interest of protecting our congregation and the community at large. And three months ago today-ish, um, we returned. Um, and since that moment, we have done all kinds of variations of service. I think we counted six different variations of how we have done service um, up to this point. Um, yeah. And... Uh, it has been an amazing thing, and uh, there's been some hurdles. We've had rain, we've had smoke, we've had now excessive heat, um, and uh, the only thing we're missing is pestilence, um, and we're praying days don't come, amen, at least this morning. Um, but I think it's appropriate if you would stand with me one more time, and you knew this was coming because we never just sit down. I think it's appropriate for us this morning to go before the Lord in prayer and thank him for his faithfulness to us. It has been a hard season. Nobody that's done ministry would tell you this has been an easy go um, as a, a cultural understanding. But God has been so good to us and so faithful to us. Um, and we see his faithfulness this morning in the people that are gathered here, those that will join us because they are out of town or vacationing or because they were wise and they stayed inside with their air conditioning. Um, but uh, we can see God's faithfulness in that. And, uh, and we sat as a board this last week and talked about how here at Stony Point, this has been the best financial year we've ever had. And that is God's faithfulness in the midst of a very, very difficult time. And that is not anything that we have produced. That is not anything that is um, in our staff specifically. It is the goodness of God being poured out upon his people during a difficult time. And so if you would join me this morning, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer before we open his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. And we stand here overwhelmed this morning with your goodness and how you have brought us through and how you continue to carry us through. And we just want to worship you this morning, God, that you 
You are true, that you are right, that you are good God who is with us through every circumstances. And, and we thank you, God, as we have seen you over this last six months work in our congregation, work amongst these people, your people in this place, um, and you have faithfully brought your work to be here in Sonoma County through that. And we thank you, God, for your goodness in that. And we pray, God, moving forward this next six months so we cannot possibly fathom what it will bring and how we will minister. We pray that you would bless that work that you would bless these families sitting here this morning, those joining us through video, those that cannot be with us at all today, God, that you would bless them, that your work may go forward, and that those that are in this community may hear the truth of your word because of your faithfulness to us. In your name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. If you want to find your seats, I know it is unbelievably hot this morning um, and uh, something we're not accustomed to. I said to Ross, I am thankful we have brothers and sisters who do this every week um, in different parts of our state. Uh, they pastor in places that literally this is the norm. I'm so grateful that is not our norm. Amen. We are so grateful for fog, I cannot tell you. Uh, every time we leave Sonoma County and we drive back in, and as we hit like Livermore-ish, and you can see the fog bank, it's like, oh, Jesus, we're home. You are so good. You have uh, brought the fog once more, and we pray it will come. Uh, so I say all that to say this. If you need to move around, we understand this morning. If you need to slip in uh, to a shady spot, if it is just you are melting, if you need to turn your car on back there and get a little air conditioning going, we know how it is. Uh, we will not be bothered at all all by that this morning. But we do want to move very quickly into God's word and just speak very quickly about a few things. As if we have talked already this morning, uh, it has been a trying six or so months, things that you can never fathom. Who would thought that we would have a pandemic that closed everything down to reopen, to close everything down to reopen? I'm so tired of the opening, closing, opening, closing. Just make up your minds. Um, but uh, it is a wearing thing and the fear that comes with that constantly for us. And then we put Let's just be honest. I, I know people live during other times where we've had political unrest, but I have not lived to see this level of political unrest and hatred, literal hatred for fellow Americans, people who at the end of the day want the same things that you want. And I believe that. I believe at the end of the day, we want the same things. We just see a different way of achieving that um, and, and the way we should go. And, and I do believe there's right. So if you press me, I will give you some opinions. Don't press me this morning because we are having Christian fellowship here, the higher goal. But at the end of the day, um, they're just a matter of opinions. But we attack each other in a way that is unbelievable. And you just see this unrest that is characterized in our culture. And I believe with all of my heart is a turning away from the things of God. That we sit in the position we sit in. Not, I do not believe nobody go home this morning. If you're on the video, don't take a clip and say the pandemic is accursed by God. I don't believe that. Pandemics come and go. It rains on the just and the unjust. But I believe we are sitting in the position we are in, the unsettled nature that we are sitting in, the unpeaceful nature that we are sitting in, the, the place where we are angry about simple things because we have turned our back on God as a nation. That we have looked for other places to become the source of our life, and we have turned to them believing that they would fulfill us, and they have not. And so we are now angry as a nation, as a culture, because we have turned our back on the life-giving source, the place that we, our, our souls were made to be satisfied in. Now, that doesn't get a lot of seats filled, and that is not an exciting message this morning, but it is the truth of where we sit. And as we sit here this morning, we nod our heads, and we in our souls know that is the truth of the reality of where we sit. The consequences of a sinful nature and a sinful desire to do our own things have led us to the place that we now sit as a culture. And the word of God says, in contrast to that, always abiding in this peaceful, restful, contentful place. We sang it this morning, I find rest in God's faithfulness. I mean, isn't that what you want? I want rest this morning. Last night, we uh, sat in our house. Roz came up with the idea, actually, I, Roz mentioned momentarily that we should paint our living room, and I had a day off at home, and so I moved all the furniture in the middle of our living room, and I started to paint on the hottest day of the year. <laughs> Dumbest thing you could ever do, but we sat there, and you could not find a restful place, because any time you sat too long, you became sticky. I've traveled the South several times. I know some of you like that humid heat. There's something wrong with you. I will pray for you. Um, but I'm convinced that hell will be hot and humid. And it was what we experienced yesterday. That's just sticky heat. And it's this unsettled place. 
this unrestful place where we just can't find comfort and we can't find rest. And we experienced that this morning. I can see most of you already like, oh, maybe if I go here, I can get a little breeze. Or if I move here, right, that is an unsettled place that we sit as a culture. And it is where many of us, even as believers, have wandered to because of we've listened to so many talking heads and so many unsettled people, we become unsettled in our own spirit, all the while having this eternal truth that we could stand upon and find rest in. So this morning, I want to talk about where we find our satisfaction. A few years ago, I hate tech problems. Uh, I know I'm from a generation that's supposed to enjoy them and be able to solve all of them, but I do not like them. I think you should be able to turn on the computer and it should always work and do what you want. I hate cars for the same reason. I know some of you love cars. I am frustrated that you have to change the oil in your car. Like, why can't they make a car? We live in a first world country that has all kinds of technology. I can literally put a meal in the microwave and seconds later I can have it. Why on earth do I have to change oil in my car? I hate that. It's so frustrating to me. And uh, I had to uh, recently spend about 45 minutes to an hour on the phone with tech support, which is literally like, I think it is a trial from God. Um, it is one of the most worst experiences that you will ever have. And nobody can understand your problem and nobody can solve your problem and they'll just pass you on to the next person. And so I was on uh, probably my fifth person and I'm like, no, don't transfer me, please don't transfer me. I really need you not to transfer me because every time I got transferred, they hung up on me accidentally. I'm going to go with it was accidentally. Um, and I had to call back in and sit and, and I love now they have the timer that says You've, you only have five people in front of you. And then it goes to six people. And you're like, no, that's the wrong way. And I was sitting there and I finally got James, who was clearly not James and clearly not from here. Uh, I believe James was in India, and he made up his name, and it was not encouraging. Just tell me your real name. I would like you for your real name. It's okay. Um, and uh, so James was talking to me about my problem and how he could not solve my problem ultimately, is what James told me. No, you need basically to go out and get a new one. Oh, thank you so much, five hours in, James. I appreciate for your support. And uh, so I said, well, thank you, and I tried in my very terse voice to be as nice as I possibly could. And if you judge me right now, I know you. So you were in the exact same place I was. Um, so don't judge me this morning. Uh, but uh, anyways, I said to James, well, thank you for not have, being able to help me at all. And probably said some little snide room comment. And he finished the conversation with this, and it stuck out to me. Are you satisfied? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness, you clearly don't get it. Are you satisfied? At the end of this long process that I did not have any of my needs met, are you satisfied? And I think that is the world in a nutshell for us today. We have traced all kinds of crazy things, finances, and let's say we've had the best stock market we've ever had, immense amount of wealth, and yet we are unsatisfied. It does not take long looking at our culture to find people who have immense amount of wealth and chase crazy perversions and chase crazy ideas and ultimately end their life because their wealth did not satisfy. We have people who search for it in academia or search for the satisfaction in, in, inside of knowledge or human understanding, and they pursue it and pursue it and pursue it, only at the end of their life to realize it was for nothing and they understood nothing, that they did not come up with a cure for their disease, or they did not find a way to solve their family's problems, and they still faced the same thing. They were unsatisfied at the end of all of it. We have people who look for it in other people. And anyone that's ever tried to do that will tell you, you will be unsatisfied no matter how good that other person is. Because nobody is made to fulfill you completely. They are to be an, a, a, an accent, an extra, a, a blessing in your life, not to be the end-all, be-all of you. And our culture tells us, no, pursue that. If you get the right person and they are just perfect enough, you will be satisfied and everything will go well for you. And anyone that's been married for any period of time is going, that's not exactly how that works. Because on the best day, you have two different people with two different opinions. And if they're anything like our house, they're strong opinions. And now we've raised, I don't know what we've raised, but we've raised three more to have an opinion. I thought, you shouldn't have opinions about this. You are way too young to be thinking this way. Life is going to go very cranky for you. We are unsatisfied as a culture, always pursuing more. Now, I appreciate that. I will admit this morning, I am a person of that. As I said already today, I sat in my living room and thought, I don't really got anything to do today. Let's paint, which is the epitome of I'm unsatisfied, right? Give me something to do. Fill me so I don't have to think too long about what's going on in this world. We search and search for satisfaction. We may think this morning that we are unique in that cultural positioning, but the scripture is full of people just like you and me who searched. 
who, who spent their entire existence searching for what would satisfy to find nothing except for a living, breathing relationship with Jesus Christ. We have Nicodemus who searched all of his life, was a man of the law, a perfect by the biblical standing, and, and, and searched all of his life through the religious thought, only to sneak around in the dark of the night saying, I can't be seen with this guy, but he's got something I need. And he comes and sits with Jesus and says, man, can you satisfy my soul's cry? Only then to be very confounded, be say you have to be born again. He's like, how can that happen? How on earth? He searched. You have the rich young ruler who says at the end of the story of the rich young ruler that he was saddened because he had immense wealth, and the idea of giving that wealth up was just too much for him to bear. He'd spent too much of his life pursuing this, and to turn his back on that at this point and say, I'd give all that up was just too much for him. He has immense wealth, searching, 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 and not have it satisfy him. Left empty. The scripture is full of people just like you and me who have found that there is nothing in this world that will meet our need. Today we're going to spend just a moment in John chapter 4, and if the wind cooperates with me, we'll stay there. But in John chapter 4, somebody else, and probably a story we're very acquainted with, who searched for their soul to be satisfied, only to be disappointed over and over again by this world. And so if you want to turn quickly with me in John 4, it might be in your Bible, I always knew it as the woman at the well. My Bible says the woman, uh, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. That sounds so much nicer, doesn't it? But it says this. It says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. I'm going to stop there for a moment. We could spend a whole time here. But Jesus, in his wisdom, says, it's not time to pick this fight. And I would say to some of you this morning, there are some fights you don't need to pick. There's some things that just don't need to be said. I was having a conversation with somebody in the middle of the grocery store, and they were spouting a lot of their opinions, and I just thought, I'm going to keep my thoughts to myself. It is not the right time. Some of you could have some much more peaceful lunches or dinners tonight if you would just go, now's not the right time. They're not ready to hear it. Let me step back for a moment. Hold this truth. There are some truths that we have been given as believers that our world is not quite ready for. And to toss them out there is to just waste the goodness of them on a world that is not prepared to hear it. Particularly at the point that we are in our culture, there is an angriness to our culture at the moment. And us throwing our truth of God's word, the most precious parts of who we are and what we hold, is not a value in this current world. There are moments that we wisely step back and say, I'm just going to hold that for a moment. And when this all goes to hell in a handbasket, because it will... I will speak up with the truth of God's word because that might be the moment that you are prepared to hear that. So often we miss the God moment, the Jesus moment, the moment that he intends for us to use his truth because we want to push our own timing. And we don't want somebody we love to fall that far in the mud. So we think we're going to stop them from it. And Jesus here says, oh no, they're getting a little too cranky over there, so I'm just going to leave town for a bit. We don't need to have this conversation yet. There's a more important conversation that I need to have down the road. We could all probably use a moment to breathe today, and I hope God's laying on your heart. The Holy Spirit's speaking right now going, oh, okay, I got to dial that back a little bit. I need to pull myself in. I need to maybe apologize and say, I'm sorry, this was not the time or place, and I, we just need to let that go. Uh, my bad. Um, because that is what the example that Christ lays for us here. It says, so the Lord learned of this, and he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sizar, and near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son uh, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tried as he, uh, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was the sixth hour, or the middle of the day is what they mean. It was about noon. Uh, and about what we're about to approach right now. And I imagine if you've walked a while, you're a little tired and sitting next to a well and getting a nice cool drink of water um, and a shady moment is something that seems of value. And so Jesus sits there for a moment, and, and it, on the surface it can look like a chance thing. He just happened to sit by the well. He just happened to leave because the Jewish leaders um, were getting a little cranky. But in my heart, I believe he was doing this intentionally. And all of these things that were going on were not by chance, but were ordained by God to bring him to this moment so that he could speak to this individual. I believe you sit here this morning or maybe this evening you sit in your home and you are listening to this because God has ordained for you to hear what needed to be said to you this morning. He wants to speak to you this morning from the truth of his word and he wants to touch your heart where you are today. 
I, I praise God, as Rosie sang this morning for us already, his promises are yes and amen, and his promises are faithful to us. His promise to us is that he gives us new mercies every morning to address exactly where we are. He never leaves us without the, the strength that we need for the day that we are facing. And some of us need to hear that in the midst of this struggle, you are exactly where God placed you. Do not become dissatisfied at the fact that you are sitting by a well in the heat of the day. It is exactly what God intended to do with you. It is exactly where he placed you because he had a purpose and a plan for where you were. And Jesus is exactly where he was supposed to be, though on a surface it does not look like it. In fact, in a few verses here we're going to read, his disciples decide, well, we need something to eat, so maybe we should go back to the town. Why are we sitting outside of town? I can totally see myself. I do not like I, my family. Uh, they do not like being hot. Uh, Roz grew up in Bakersfield all of her life, and uh, heat was like her thing. What we realized is air conditioning was her thing. <laughs> heat was not her thing, air conditioning. Um, they literally just didn't go outside. And we will go down to Bakersfield, and like Abby and her will literally melt running from the car to the house. And I'm like, you grew up here. How on earth do you not know how to do this? Um, but she's just been here in Sonoma County so long. Um, and so the idea of sitting out next to the well sounds like a bad idea. I'm like, let's get up in some nice restaurant where we can get a good iced tea, and, and let's plan that. And so the disciples are like, Jesus, what are we doing here? This is not where we're supposed to be. Like, that is the definition of 2020, isn't it? Well, this is not, God, I don't know what went wrong. You gave us the wrong year. This was not... I can tell you, we sat down in a staff and talked and plotted out what we were going to do as ministry this year, how God was going to use us in this community. This was not on the list of things that we were going to do this year. I've learned all kinds of medical regulations, and I know the county health office. I didn't even know we had a county health office before all of this. Um, And and I know her name, and and sometimes I like her name, and sometimes I don't like her name, depending on where she's moving us on the scale. Uh, That's just honest this morning. Uh, and, and, And man, but it is exactly where God intended us to be. It is exactly the ministry that he intended us to be doing. It, it's, it's refined his church to say there are some things that are so important that I can't let the world get in the way. We used to show up to an air-conditioned building with nice soft chairs, and church was easy on a Sunday morning. Right? It was simple. It was a, yay, I get to go to church, and it was easy. This last year, we've had to be reminded of the fact that it is sometimes a sacrifice to come together and worship. And we are still blessed in that. Because they haven't showed up on our doorstep yet hauling any of us off. And there's nobody persecuting us. Nobody's taking names today. We are still blessed and fortunate in the the midst of this. And we are exactly where God intends us to be to do exactly the work that God is intending us to do. And I believe fully in the years to come, because of our faithfulness during this time, and because of God's faithfulness to us, he is going to use this and he is going to restore what has been taken from us in this time. God is going to fully restore and he's going to bring back tenfold is what the scripture tells us what has been taken from this time if we are faithful to him. So we should rejoice in the fact that we get to sit by the well for a moment waiting to show up and see what God is going to do. It says this as he's standing there and man, I've taken way too long already. We were supposed to be done. It says this. It says in the sixth hour, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Many of us probably, if we spend any amount of time in church, we understand this, that there was this warring between the two cultures and it was not somebody that you were supposed to talk to. And, and I wish we could say in our current culture that was no longer the case, but there are some places, there are some people that culturally we feel like maybe we shouldn't talk to, and it would be off-putting, and I shouldn't ask that uh, of them, and they shouldn't ask that of me. I was reading an article this last week, and it was sad to me, but it was basically somebody saying that, that, that as they look at a smile from somebody, they see it as a judgment of them, and that they don't know what to, how to take that or read that, and so they read everything into the smile and thought, what a sad way to live life that you are judgmental of a smile. I can tell you, I never, these days I'm like, are you smiling through your mask? I'm just gonna presume you're smiling through your mask because I'm happy to see you because I love people and I'm gonna presume you're happy to see me. But how sad to look at that. That's how this woman saw life. People are judging me. They're judging me because of my ethnicity, because of the color of my skin. Isn't that the sad state of where we are these days? There, There was decades where we fought to not have people judged based on the color of their skin, only now to do it even more. And all around, I hate you because you're this color, you hate me because I'm this color, we just all hate each other. 
That's the culture that she sat in. And the truth of God's word is that skin doesn't matter. That gender does not matter, except for the fact that God has designed them to be what we are. But it does not matter in our value. That, that socioeconomic, this morning we sit here from all different backgrounds. We sit people of different ethnicities, amen? I was once told I was a racist. I said, how can that be? I am married to the most beautiful Mexican woman and have children of mixed race. I have a niece from Africa and a niece from China. Oh, my goodness. We are not racist. How dare you, by just the color of my skin, judge me that way? We sit here with all kinds of different races. We sit here with different people of different socioeconomic backgrounds and education backgrounds. We sit here as a church, one family united together in the truth of God's word. And that is what the word of God does. It is the only thing that does that. There is no other philosophy in this world. There is no other political organization. There is no other protest. And I will go on record saying that we'll accomplish that. Only the word of God will accomplish the uniting of people and the set aside of our preconceived ideas to the place that we can sit down and talk and eat with one another. And Jesus, the Jew, the best of the Jews, sits down with a Samaritan woman that is, she says, you shouldn't talk to me. What are you doing? Do you know how your reputation is going to be ruined by the fact that we are sitting here together? And she sits there, and they have this conversation. And she says, don't you know? How dare you ask me? How dare you ask me for help? We shouldn't even have this conversation. And Jesus answers her and says this, if you knew the gift of God and who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This morning, I want to talk very briefly about the idea of living water and why each and every one of us needs living water. What we had yesterday was not enough. What, what satisfied yesterday was not enough. Today, we need the living water of God, the Holy Spirit walking and moving in our lives. What, it, what the scripture talks about is abiding or walking with the Spirit of God. And too often in our Christian world, we have left that for a knowledge of the things of God. We have thought we needed higher education. We thought we needed to be in the places of power. We thought we needed to be um, uppity and, and showy and, and, and needed to be acceptable to this culture. And we have left the abiding and the living water of God. And we wonder why we are no longer satisfied. Because we have gone to a dry well. And Jeremiah talks about how the people of God, they went to this new place and they gave up their old wells, the wells that had satisfied and given them waters for generations. And they dug new wells, hoping that they would find something new to satisfy them. And it says it did not satisfy and they had to return to the old wells. Here, they sit at an old well, a well that was dug by Joseph when the land was given to him. Now think, that is old you might have some family heirlooms. This is old, generations old, the beginning of time kind of old um, well that had satisfied their people for that long. And she sits there and says, you have something better than this? How could you possibly have something better than this? And, and he, she says to him, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with the well. Um, where, you can get, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than the father Jacob who gave this well and drank of it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Or the people that established this nation, that established this truth, that established this relationship with God, are you better than them? It's like she catches this conversation. You have no picture. How are you going to draw anything? And then she jumps to this deep theological understanding, and you're going to surpass the truth that we were given so long ago? And so often that is the thought process that we have. Somehow we're going to search for something more than Jesus. We have all kinds of Christian conferences these days. Oh, come here and I'll give you your number and you'll understand all of your uh, personality traits so that you, know, you can fully understand how God has made you to be, as if we needed more than Jesus. Or come over here and for 1995, you can buy this oil and you'll rub it on your body and it will heal you from all kinds of illness and sickness. And, and it is right up there with the Holy Spirit is more than Jesus. Or here, I'm selling this conference, come and I will teach you how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you just say these things and buy my book for 1995, I will give you more than Jesus. See, there is one thing that it says here will satisfy and one thing only, the living water that is provided by a living Savior. 
Too often we are caught up in our religious practice. Too often we are caught up in our religious debate. And we walk away from our first love, as Revelation says. The, the passionate following of a Savior who each and every morning greets me where I am, tells me what I need to do today, and tells me how to walk in the truth of what I am facing at the moment. We are facing some strange days. We are facing some hard things. But when I have a walking, living relationship with a, a Savior, he can tell me how to face those today. He can tell me how to address the cultural problems of my day. He can tell me how to address my family issues. He can tell me how to live in a house where I'm locked up all the time with five people and we literally can go nowhere. He can tell me how to do that and he can give me the wisdom because I have a living relationship with him. And that's what it says here. Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will never thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I get, sorry, let me back up there. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But ever, whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. I want to talk just briefly about the fact that we thirst over and over again. I love, uh, I have wanderlust. I love to travel. I have a goal of seeing all 66 national parks. Every time they add one, I'm like, stop doing that to me because I have a goal of seeing all of them. And I have a goal, um, I, if you come into our kitchen, I have mugs from Starbucks from the states that I have visited, and I have a goal of one day getting all 50. We'll see if it happens. It's a nice goal. But I love the idea of traveling. I love an adventure. I love going someplace. What's so frustrating right now is part of going someplace is eating a good place um, and seeing their sights, and you can't do all of that outdoors. It's very frustrating to me at every turn. I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, and I know it's what needs to be, and we want to keep people safe, and we care about that, but it is a very, very frustrating process. But I can tell you, I get home from a vacation, and for a moment, I feel satisfied. Oh, that was fun. I loved it. Guess what? Two weeks later, I need another vacation. Amen? It is the reality of where we are. We painted our living room probably five or six years ago. Roz loved the color. It was the best color ever. This was going to be the color. She loved it. She loved it. This weekend, we painted it gray. She asked me what I thought. I said, I love what you love, baby. She's like, I want you to have more opinion. I said, if it was purple, I would have more opinion that I can live with gray. Love what you love, baby, uh, because I want to be satisfied. But the point is we are never satisfied. We drink from these things hoping they will satisfy. They will somehow fill us. The woman at the well, she did it with people. It says here later, she had five husbands, and the man she was with currently was not her husband. She was clearly searching for something to fulfill her. And we can stand here all judgy of her this morning, but the reality is it may be people for us, and we might have uh, burned through a lot of relationships, or it's money, or it's entertainment, or it's a status symbol, or it's um, power, or it's having the big office. Whatever it is, each of us pursues something that ultimately will not be enough when we get it. We were cleaning out our kitchen this week, or our living room, and I was pulling out things, and I was like, oh my goodness, kids, we have to get rid of junk. And at the very back of the shelf, I found my original iPod, which kids don't even know what those things are anymore because they have cell phones that do this for them. And I thought about bringing you this morning because literally the kids sitting here on the front row would be like, what is that foreign thing? And why is it so ugly? <clears throat> and at the moment, it was something that satisfied me deeply. I remember standing in line going, woo, I got one being thrilled and thinking, this will hold everything I ever needed to hold. I will never need a CD, which is also a foreign object to them, uh, ever again, because it will satisfy, only to now have it sit in a place that I didn't even know and collect dust. I don't even know if it works anymore, because it did not satisfy. The things of this world will never satisfy. They will never be enough. They will always be a pursuit of more. And yet, even in the Christian world, we see it. We have to have bigger and more and be more entertained. And, and how can I be more presence on Instagram so I can have more likes and, and be more showy and be seen by everyone? We pursue constantly the more, the more, the more, the more, believing somehow that will fulfill us. And Jesus comes here and says, nope, it will never satisfy. You will drink of it, and you will have to drink again, and you will have to drink again. In fact, you will end up with a drinking problem because you will always have to return to it. The thing that brought satisfaction, we will always need more of. It is why we have perversion in our world, because what's satisfied in the moment will not satisfy the next. And Jesus says this, he flips it, and he says, we don't need this living or this water that does not satisfy. I will give you a water that will satisfy you for the rest of your life. 
that will be with you for the rest of your life. And if you sit here this morning or you're listening online this morning, there is a water that is available. There is a life available to you that will satisfy you, that will meet your greatest need exactly where you are and fill you up and give you contentment and joy for the rest of your days. Every night we sit and pray with our kids, and it is my prayer, not that they would just have enough Jesus for today, but they would have a Jesus relationship that they walked all the days of their life. Amen. I was thinking this morning, in a few weeks I will be 40. I accepted Jesus in October of my, when I was five years old. I had just turned five. We were going to night church. Some of you don't even know what that is because we've never been to night church. But on Sunday mornings, you went to church, you went home, had lunch, took a nap, and then you got up and had night church. It was a great life. I came to know Jesus when I was five years old. I have not lived uh, a five marriage life and not uh, the person I'm living with not being. Uh, I have been blessed to sit under the teaching of God's word the majority of my life. Overwhelming majority of my life. That's not to say I was perfect. I had some attitude things and I had some anger things and I had some things that had to be worked out like every person. And there are times I'm tempted to go, oh, let me stick it to them. But uh Overwhelmingly, I did not walk in those big sins, those evident sins, those things that are so clear. But the truth is that it is a satisfying truth that can walk with you all the days of your life. And we should be teaching our children not that you're going to go out and mess up big time in your teenage years, and that's okay. Come back to this when you're done. No, we should be teaching them there is a relationship with a living Savior that can fulfill you for the rest of your life, a living water that can satisfy for all the days of your life. Let's just be honest here, though. I've walked in that satisfaction a lot of years. What draws and I have done some hard things over the last five years. We've had fires in this community. We've faced cancer personally twice. We were not signing up for that one, I can tell you, the second time. Uh, definitely. This year has warred with my satisfaction more than anything. This last six months have been some of the hardest six months to face and be satisfied and go, God, what are you doing? Those other things, I'll just be honest. I had the faith God was going to take care of us. Whatever we had to face, God was going to be with us in that. And I could see his hand moving so clearly. This last six months has been a little harder. Amen? Am I the only one? Maybe I'm just preaching to me this morning. But it's been a hard road as we have seen everything stripped away from our lives. Everything that we have relied on or turned to has at some point been taken from us. And thankfully, we are seeing the return of many of those things. But they have been taken from us. And so I have had to return to this truth and say there is a relationship with a living Savior that will satisfy. And it says here, for those of us that have come to the knowledge of who Jesus is, and we have drawn from that well, it is a well that will well up inside of us now and overflow and feed those around us. Too often our Christian self-help thought process has become this idea that we now need Jesus and it's about us. How can I get better and how can I be the best me? Kind of took that from the book title, didn't I? Got myself in a little trouble this morning. <laughs> That's not what it's about. I'm supposed to come to this saving relationship with Jesus, and it is supposed to become a living, breathing, overwhelming well that flows out from me to the community around me and feeds the world. That's why we can't give up church. Right. It's why I will stand here this morning and say this gathering is 100% essential to the livelihood of this community because of this church and other churches do not rise up and allow the wellspring of the truth of God's word to flow out from them. Then how will this world ever know the truth of his word? Amen. And, and we love the mediums that we have available to us. And we want to use every last technology and we want to offer to people that can't be here. But YouTube is not a replacement for the gathering of the believers to be with one another and have the well of the truth of God's word spread out from us. It is essential that we become that well. And if you feel dry this morning, I want to give you two things before we end. How do we fill that well back up? We do it two ways, and it is the things we have already done this morning. We first find our heart of worship. We turn to that first love. She stands here and says, man, you are something special. And I have had a messed up life that has not satisfied me at all. But you've got something I need. And we fall back in love with Jesus. We fall in love with his word and the truth of his word. Too often we rely on this one moment in Sunday morning to carry us for a week. And it is not enough to fill your well. You must be daily in the word of God, feeding that, digging deeper into his word, that you may know the truth of his word. The second thing is worship. She comes to a realization of the fact that he is God in their presence. 
And that drives her to recognize him. It says she goes back to her town and says, oh my goodness, this man who told me everything that you already know about me and he still talked to me is out there and he knows you too. Come follow me to him. She began to worship him for the savior that he was. See, worship is not just a matter of us singing. It is a lifestyle that says everything I have, I turn over to God. I lay it at your feet, Jesus. Do what you want with me. And it is definitely worship when we sing together, and it is something that we do here on morning, and it should encourage our heart. And I tell you, every Sunday I gather here, and the worship team leads us in worship, and it wells up inside of me, that living water, that truth. I feel the power that comes from recognizing who Jesus is in our lives corporately. But it is a lifestyle of worship. At every turn, I recognize who God is in my life. Some of you this morning are a dry well. You, you knew the truth of God's word, you felt it, but you this morning feel dry from the stresses of life. In fact, you maybe thought, I don't know if I can make it this morning to church. It is just too much. That, that heat, oh my goodness. I saw some of you this morning in shorts. I was like, I'm envious this morning. I know it's not right to envy, but I am envious this morning of your shorts and flip-flops. I was this close. But we're dry this morning. And we need to return to that first love, the love of his word and the worship of him for who he is in our lives so that God may well up inside of us and minister to this community. I talked this morning. I believe God will restore um, Stony Point, restore the ministry that comes from this place and that we will do basketball again and that we will do children's ministry again and that we will do youth work again and that we will open our doors to a community as a whole once more and say, come be with us and we will be that beacon of hope in this world. But it will come because we are a well that is well dug, overflowing. And it is the thing that we need this morning. If you want to stand with me, we're going to close in a word of prayer. And my prayer this morning is that God would begin to stir in your heart that first love and that passion as we dismiss today. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that even on this very hot day and uh, in the circumstances that we are currently facing, that you are here with us and that we have seen you and that we have felt your presence. And we thank you, God, for the way that you move and work. And I pray, God, today as we leave this place, that you would begin to stir in us that living water, that well that overflows and satisfies our life, brings contentment and joy and peace. The, the promises of your word would come to life inside of us. But more importantly, God, that it would overflow into this community. And that we would be that for one another here at Stony Point, that we would be a place that we can turn and see the living, breathing God moving and working. But more importantly as well, for an entire community, a lost world, a world, a culture that we live in currently that is lost and dying with hopelessness. God, I pray that we would become a wellspring of joy and contentment and peace and that we would lead them back to a living, breathing Savior, that we would draw them unto you, God, because of what they see that you doing in our lives. I pray, God, that you would be with each and every one of us as we leave this place this morning and that you would draw us back once more to be with you next week. In your name we pray, amen.